welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Future of Numismatics Symposium here at the 64th Annual Fund Convention. We are grateful to the Florida United Numismatists for their collaboration as host to the symposium, particularly Cindy Whipker, uh, who helped us coordinate tonight's event. As you well know, there is a range of topics to consider as we assess the future of numismatics. Tonight's speakers will highlight just a few key themes. We will learn about developments and priorities in our hobby and industry, and our guests will add their unique perspective to these discussions. We hope that you will be enriched by these presentations, and we wish everyone an enjoyable experience at the Fun Show this week. And now, I'd like to introduce Gary Atkins, president of the ANA's Board of Governors, who will provide the pre-symposium poll results and introduce our speakers. Gary? Thank you very much. Um, I just want to assure you that we're going to try to keep this moving along tonight. Uh, our speakers will have about somewhere between six and ten minutes to kind of give you an overview of what their topics are. Uh, and at the end of the symposium, all of their topics, their papers, uh, some of their, their talks are sh much redacted from what the papers that they've created for you. And those will be available at the end of the seminar. Uh, you can take those home with you and hopefully uh, glean a lot of information out of that. So I think it's going to be a good evening. Um, and again, we're going to keep it moving. So uh, I'd like to thank Kim for her, for, and the ANA for all their hard work. Again, Cindy Whipker, uh, without the fun organization, we wouldn't have this uh, venue to have it uh, this evening. So thanks to them. And I'd especially like to thank Donna Freider. Where is Donna? Oh, she's sitting there. OK. Donna Freider uh, put a lot of work into this event and sending out invitations and pulling all this together was a tremendous amount of work. So I really appreciate that. Um, anyway, I want to give special thanks to our speakers tonight. Uh, I went out and I contacted a lot of different people to try to get different perspectives on the marketplace and uh, what, what they feel is you know, the future of our hobby. And uh, you know, I had a few people that declined and didn't want to do speaking and didn't, weren't comfortable speaking publicly. And other people that said, yeah, I'd love to do it. And uh, so I asked them to put together a talk for this evening and it's pretty varied. I think you're going to find it very interesting. Uh, and so we have a, a good mix of speakers here this evening. So I'd like to thank all of them for their preparation and, and making this event happen. Uh, also to Charles Morgan. Charles has agreed graciously to, uh, to film tonight's event. So hopefully, hopefully we'll get that up on the internet for uh, collectors, dealers, everybody to see that on the ANA website at some point down the road. So we appreciate that, Charles. Um, let's see here. Anyway, um, the question is, you know, why did we decide to have an event like this? And I think, you know, my opinion was that it was really crucial to bring people together, talk about ideas, talk about where we're headed uh, with the future of numismatics, with collecting, with dealing, uh, all the things that are, we're, we live in a really fast-paced world, and things change all the time, and, and the, the whole idea is keeping up with the changes that take place, uh, making sure that we're relevant in the marketplace. And so that's why the ANA and Fund decided to get together uh, to have this event. There's a lot of different factors, obviously, that will affect the, the future of numismatics. Uh, a lot of them, we, we understand the questions, and a lot of them we haven't even thought about yet. So uh, hopefully a symposium like this uh, gets, our, gets us putting our thinking caps on and, and creates some a thought process where we can develop ideas and develop a communication and bringing different segments of the market together uh, to make sure that the future of numismatics is really solid. So that's our whole goal here tonight. Um, certainly understanding these issues is key, and, and obviously none of us has all the answers. Uh, they're very complex and require thoughtful investigation and circumspection. And so that's why we brought the speakers here tonight to give us their perspective on, on different aspects of the marketplace that they think are important. Um, Again, they'll have about six to ten minutes to present. Uh, we're going to keep them on track. And um, we're waiting for Dave Bowers. Unfortunately, John Feigenbaum was delayed and is probably not going to make it, from what I understand. So I apologize for that. Um, but anyway, 
Uh, we want to get started. I'd ask you to all please, if you have cell phones, silence those so they don't go off on, you know, as a courtesy to our speakers and give them your attention. And we're going to be out of here, you know, as quickly as we can. We'll have a question and answer session at the end of all of the presentations. So anything you want to bring up, anything you feel like is important to the hobby that you want to talk about, uh, we'll afford you that opportunity at the end of the session. So anyway, uh, I'd like to start out, we, uh, we, sent, we sent out about 300 invitations uh, to various uh, people in the, in the hobby, collectors, dealers, uh, people that are involved in publication, supply, you name it. We, we tried to get as many different people involved as possible. I see our guest Dave Bowers is here, so thank you, David. Uh, but anyway, we sent out a 10 very simple questions before the seminar to get people's input on what they thought were different aspects of the hobby and what you know how they thought. And they were very simple answers. It was either yes, no, or uncertain. That was the options for the answering the questions. So um, about 60% of you from the results. We, again, we sent out 300 questionnaires. We got about 79 responses, which is a really good response for something like this. Usually, if you get 10%, you're doing well. So getting uh, about 26% was, we were very happy with that. So it should give us a pretty good indication. But anyway, 60% of you said that dealers do not adequately, adequately promote coin collecting. That was an interesting thing. 60% also said that mass marketers are a threat to collecting. 90% said coin shows and conventions are still relevant. Many people, you know, I've talked to people that say, yeah, coin shows are not relevant anymore. But our survey at least showed that that's not the case. Also, 90% said that education is a key to the success of conventions and coin shows, providing education to the public and to collectors. 60% said coins offer good value in today's market. Another interesting thing is, you know, there's always that question is, what's, are, are coins still a good value? Can, you know, can we still find bargains out there? Are there great things to collect and, uh, and continue collecting? 66% said that pricing and grading is complicated and as such is detrimental, has a detrimental effect on the hobby. And so one of our speakers tonight is going to talk a little bit about grading. And, you know, uh, back when I started grading, back in the 1960s or in the 50s when I started collecting, uh, it was a very simple thing. You either had, if you were talking about uncirculated, you were talking about uncirculated, choice uncirculated, and gem uncirculated. Now we have all kinds of different grades of uncirculated. We have pluses, we have stars. So for the newcomer getting involved in the hobby, uh, it presents a, a quagmire for them. What, what does that really mean? What's the difference in an MS-61 and an MS-63? And the same thing even with the circulated grades, if you have different levels of circulated grades. So 95% um, said that technology, media, and internet are critical to the future of numismatics. I couldn't agree more with that. Obviously, with uh, the rapid change in our society now, and everybody has a little mini computer on their hip, uh, they, there's amazing things you can do with it. So technology obviously plays a big part of that. And media, again, is also very important. 68% said that accurate numismatic information is read, readily available to collectors. And I would agree with that. We have a great publication, the Numismatist at ANA, that's uh, enjoyed by all of our members. And uh, there's all kinds of publications out there that you can get. And you can go on the internet and find any number of sources for of information if you're a beginning collector. So that's great news. <clears throat> Only 46% anticipate a bright future for the hobby and industry. So that was a little disappointing. 86% felt that learning from the past is critical to planning for the future. And Dave Bowers will be talking a little bit about that this evening. So with that said, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. I was going to do a little um, uh, bio on each speaker, but I think in order to keep it moving, we won't do that. I think you probably know most of the speakers that are here tonight. So our first speaker is Rob Ober. Thank you. Thank you. I'm one of those people that um, is not comfortable speaking in public, but we'll figure it out. Um, if anyone is wondering who I am or how I got here, uh, I'm still trying to figure that out myself. 
Actually, I just met Gary in the hallway, and I told him my name was Brett Charville, so he let me up here. Well, thank you, Gary. It is an honor to be here. Um, I was introduced into the world of numismatics, like many of us, by my father taking me to local coin clubs in Chicago. Uh, what inevitably drew me back was the love of history, and that's why I love the numismatics. Over the last 10 years, I learned a lot about, the co about coins and the industry. Much of what I learned, though, is that the opportunities that were there for those that came before me were not there for me. And I'm concerned that the opportunities that were there for me may not be there for my children. Um, I also learned that there is a dark undercurrent of manipulation, insolvency, and sometimes even fraud in our industry. But what I've learned is, for the most part, there's a genuinely passionate community of dealers that I've come to call family. What I'd like to do today is not simply present some issues as I see them or solutions. Most importantly, I would like to begin a conversation about how to implement these solutions and others that will be presented today. Only with the cooperation and concerted effort by the people in this room can we begin to make those much needed changes. We'll certainly not find all the answers to the questions we raise, but I hope to pro provoke some thought on the subjects. I would like to remind us where we came from in an effort to bring us back to the meaning of our hobby. There's a fear ripping through our industry that our hobby is in decline. You hear it on the fourth floor, in chat rooms, and in coin shops across America. That sentiment is toxic on one hand, but could prove to be productive on the other. Those of us who are dealers seem to go through our days in a fog, chasing that dollar. After all, we are here to make a living. However, I think many of the important conversations are being neglected. I feel the same way that many in this room feel. The hobby that, that we love feels like it is slowly slipping away from us and being replaced by other interests. We have all reaped the, rewar reaped the rewards of so many that came before us, from the innovations of national coin shows, to third-party grading, to the trading of items online, to accessible and accurate pricing. Since the advent of the internet, very few innovations have been realized. The burden of responsibility is now in the hands of my generation. We cannot continue to stand on the shoulders of giants. We must each take responsibility of continued innovation or suffer the consequences. If we want our hobby to flourish, we have to bring positivity and new ideas to the table. Positive energy breeds positive action. For many decades, we have focused on encouraging our youth to get involved in coins in the hopes that they will later come back. I feel the gap now is that we are not encouraging and mentoring young dealers enough. That is what I plan to focus my career on. I want to promote young dealers and give them the tools and access that they need to be successful. We also need to work with the 30-something crowd, grooming that generation to take the torch when the time comes teaching them by example how to be honest dealers, showing them the consequences when you pursue interests that are less than ethical. And while we're on the subject of promoting dealers, how about putting more focus on women in our industry? Why is it that our industry is predominantly male? We do our best reaching out to kids, but are we doing enough to support organizations that are making a concerted effort to reach out to women, like women in, numism in numismatics? Why not? We need diversity in our ranks. Granted, collecting coins has been historically a male-oriented hobby, but that does not mean that we cannot find a niche where women can share in the joy of our, in our, of our hobby. Granted, men will spend an eternity trying to find out what women want to no avail. That is why we need strong women to lead this charge. We need to follow their lead. I feel names like Myrna Leiterman, Kathy Baloa, Kim Kick, and Fund's own Cindy Whitker have built a foundation and proven that there is an opportunity for future leaders to emerge. We do spend a lot of time reaching out to Boy Scouts. By not simultaneously, with the same vigor, reaching out to Girl Scouts, are we setting a predetermination of what we want our demographic to be? 
My thought process is that dealers have the most and best opportunities to make new dealers and collectors, and it is our obligation for the longevity of our hobby to do so. A passionate dealer can create hundreds of coin collectors over their careers. Too many young dealers have devoted their talents to buying a coin, trying to upgrade the coin, and then selling to another dealer. This, as an exclusive business model, is destructive, and it's a zero-sum game for our hobby. If you ask most young dealers today, they will probably tell you that they can count on their fingers the number of actual collector, collectors that they do business with. They have very little time and resources to develop relationships with collectors. With the right tools, young coiners can spend more time working with collectors and building our hobby. I feel a bit like a fish out of water because only two years ago I was pretty inactive as far as networking and doing the show circuit. I had very little access to the wholesale market since I chose to run a local coin shop. And having a young family, I made the decision to not travel and sell most of my product online or at the shop. After getting to know many dealers in America, I now feel that I am in the majority, not the minority. I have owned and run a coin shop since 2007. So for over 10 years, I was an outsider. 10 years later, I decided to take a turn. In January 2017, I decided to turn uh, take a turn and launch a social network called Coin Dealers Helping Coin Dealers on Facebook. How many rats do we have in the group today? By applause, yeah, a few. The roundtable was intended as a way to trade with other dealers and network on a more personal level that has never been available to us before. By spring of that year, we had only a few hundred members, but we're already becoming the buzz of the industry. I think if we were to try to boil the success of Coin Dealers Helping Coin Dealers, down to two words, those words will be helping and access. This group has proven that we have some fantastic individuals in our community, many who are ready and willing to help our brethren when in need, providing access to many dealers who have never taken the steps to join some of the more traditional trading networks or associations. That is why we launched CDHCD. We realized that instead of trying to bring young dealers to us, we would go to where we already knew they were. Using the power of social media, we were able to bring to life an idea that has been discussed for maybe, maybe decades, the presence of a 24-hour online coin show. Many veteran dealers lament about how young, few young people they see at shows. The fact is, it's simply not feasible for most young dealers to make it to shows due to school and significant expenditures of traveling the country. However, there is a vibrant and robust community of young collectors and dealers that exclusively trade online and on social media. I think what the roundtable has done is essentially repackaged a few old ideas. We took the idea of a, a dealer association and repackaged it into something new and fresh. We took the idea of online trading and repackaged it into something that has proven to bring new dealers and material into the market. The roundtable is harnessing the power of social media to energize and expand our hobby. Teaching the new generation what is to be expected of them is part of what we want to do. How many of us have heard this before? Nice enough guy, writes bad checks, but always makes them right. No, this is not what we want our hobby to be. Since I began writing this speech, no less than 10 known coin dealers were raided, arrested, or indicted for fraud. In a market like this, we can expect many more to be tempted by greed. The more this happens, the more it will end up in the mainstream media, and we, we will be destroyed from within. I personally have revoked the membership of up to a dozen dealers to, due to substandard or malicious business practices. In doing so, I feel like we have set the bar for what is acceptable in our organization. We want well-established and up-and-coming dealers to know that not only will this sort of behavior not be tolerated, but their removal from our association will be publicized for all to see. I look at coin collecting today as very different than it must have been decades ago. The thrill of finding, I'm gonna hurry up because I got like one, one minute left. The, th <laughs> the thrill of finding a better day coin in circulation is all but gone, so this is important. The, the, think of it like fishing at sea versus fishing in a stock pond. I feel like the, the hunt from our hobby is gone. Um, you know, uh, going, going around the coin shows is fun, looking for coins, but finding coins in circulation, I think, is probably a huge side of what our hobby used to be, and that is just gone. So I think it's important. So we need to work, figure out a way to bring the hunt back to our hobby, and that doesn't mean 
throwing a bunch of 09 SBDBs into a tip jar at Starbucks, but I think there's a way that we can uh, we can bring it back. My final thought is that we seem to be lacking an organization that by design is intended to promote mom and pop coin shops. We need an organization that is truly devoted to driving traffic to our local coin shops throughout the United States. We feel this is a huge part of bringing our hobby back to something wholesome and robust. Can I have one more minute? Okay. This symposium, sponsored by Fun and the ANA, could be part of something great, and I am honored to be a part of it. So in conclusion, those of us in this room should not look at each other as competition, but as family. Let's look at each other as soldiers in the same fight to save our industry. Let's share ideas, not limit access to our friends. Let's offer encouragement, not build barriers. Together, we can usher in a new generation of coin dealers and collectors bringing exciting and innovative ideas to our, to our hobby. Let's not just talk about our problems. Let's not just talk about our solutions. But let's begin setting and achieving real goals. It takes an enormous amount of capital, knowledge, and connections to get into this business. Let's break down those barriers. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, just a couple ideas that I pulled out of uh, the topic that Rob just, just discussed is dealers can create thousands of collectors. I think that's really true. If dealers really are into building our hobby and so on, you have to be willing to spend time with collectors, nurture them, bring them along. So that's an important idea. Uh, the other thing is mentoring dealers. I like that idea as well because there's a lot of people who get into the coin business and think they're going to, you know, make a fortune and it's going to be great. But there's not, there's no training. There's no, you know, it's a learn as you go kind of thing. So mentorship is a good deal. Uh, collecting online. One of the things that Rob uh, had in his talk is, it's like uh, if you're collecting online, it's like fishing in a stocked pond rather than going out and fishing in the sea. Obviously, if you're fishing out of a stocked pond. It's kind of boring. It's not really a lot of fun. You go out uh, deep sea fishing in the ocean, it's a lot more fun. So I think that's why conventions and shows and things are important as well. Um, another aspect is that local coin shops have faded away. There really aren't a lot of local coin shops nowadays. I remember when I was a kid starting out in the 60s, uh, growing up in Detroit, I had 10, 12 different coin shops I could go to with great displays of coins. Uh, you can go in and talk to the owner about coins and learn about coins. We don't have that so much anymore. There's a very few real coin shops left in the country, and I think that's a big part of uh, you know, why the hobby is fading to some degree. And last but not least, women involved in numismatics. We have a lot of great women involved now, but we, we could have a lot more. So I think that's important. Anyway, speaking of strong women, I'd like to introduce Cindy Whitker, uh, who will present our next topic. Uh, my topic is the future of numismatic shows and conventions. Obviously, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't predict what's going to happen, but I know what I hope will happen. And uh, so these thoughts are strictly my own, based on 25 years of experience of organizing the fun show. And some of the different areas that I'm going to tackle are, number one, laying the foundation for a successful show. Number two, getting both dealers and collectors to the show. And number three, offering dealers and collectors opportunities and perks, because once you get them there, you want them to come back. So to lay the successful foundation for a show, what, what do you need to do? Um, I hit on four topics. Number one is accessibility. How accessible is your show? If you have a big show, like the ANA or FUN, you better be near a major airport, because it's a disaster if you're not. You have to have a venue that is fairly close to the airport, that's a plus. And uh, after traveling through airports, nobody wants to endure a long cab ride, an expensive cab ride to get to where they're going. Low parking rates at the venue is a positive, but sometimes they're controlled by the venue and you really don't have any say in the parking rates. You might be able to negotiate a little bit like we do here, the parking rates $15, they give us 10. It, it helps, little, every little bit helps. Um, Number two is hotels. Do you have plenty of hotel rooms convenient to the exhibit hall? Uh, here in Orlando, we're spread out a little bit, but we're close enough that it works. Uh, 
or the hotel price is reasonable. Now you're getting into a challenge. The closer you get to the exhibit hall, the more expensive your hotels are going to be. So you try to, you're kind of teetering on that balance all the time. So you need to negotiate the best rates that you can. Can you negotiate hotel contracts with no attrition clauses? I don't know if you understand what attrition is, but if you have an aggressive attrition clause and your, your attendees don't book in your hotels, uh, all of a sudden your show can go from operating in the, in the black to the red when the hotel slaps you with a $20,000 bill at the end of the show because you didn't meet your obligation with them. So there's always this delicate balance going on here. Um, the best of all worlds is to secure ho hotel rooms close to convention site and, and have the people fill up your block. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, sales tax. This is the third issue under laying the foundation. How friendly are the sales tax laws in the area of the planned convention? We're very fortunate here in Florida. We don't want our dealers to be harassed by aggressive tax collectors. Some of them have to deal with it in their home state. We hope they don't have it here. Uh, simpler is better. So if you have a choice of locations or venues, you at least want to look at what the sales tax laws are in that area. Another issue you want to look at is how tight are the unions in the venue that you're thinking about going to. I mean, we've all heard horror tales. I've been involved in some myself. Um, you, you don't want your organization or any of your attendees uh, to, to, co to come to your show and end up getting slapped with some giant invoice from the union when it's over. Case in point, um, Fun moved to Fort Lauderdale in 2005. We don't have union issues in Central Florida. You go into South Florida, you start getting into some. I was told that a union laborer would meet each dealer at the door and pull their little wheelie cart in for them. It'd be $50 each way. And there was no alternative to that. And our YNs could not work as pages. That was not acceptable to me. I said, how can we get this worked out? So I went to the unions, I talked to them before we arrived, and I said, tell you what, you can wheel in our dealer's carts, but our attorney's gonna draw up a little release form that they need to sign, saying they are responsible, and if anything is missing out of those carts when they get to the table, they're responsible for that, the liability thing. And uh, I said, and, and you know, some of those coins are worth millions of dollars, and, kind of and they said, you can, here, take your own carts in. With and the union never showed up in the building. So uh, <clears throat> if you can, be proactive and work out those issues in advance. To me, those are the issues for laying the set, uh, a foundation for a successful show. Now you need to get the dealers and the collectors both to the show. One of the things that's top on my list is uh, customer service. This is a service industry, no matter how you look at it. So I appreciate all the time and effort and expense that everybody takes to go to to get here. Obviously, you wouldn't be here if you didn't love it. So we need to give good service to all the people that are coming. Everybody, when you're asked a question, take the time to answer it. Just be kind and thoughtful. You never know what kind of new collector or new dealer that's going to cross your path, and you want to keep them coming back. Um, if you're a dealer, try to take a reasonable amount of time to help educate a new collector, and I do mean reasonable. Uh, it can get out of hand sometimes, I realize that. Um, I clearly, my first ANA was Atlanta in 1977. I had just started collecting Civil War tokens. I was thrilled to be there. I mean, I walked in, I've been to a major show. It's like, oh my God, when you walk in the door. And I met some wonderful dealers who, who spent a lot of time with me, helping me learn. <clears throat> and if they had not done that, I, I might have just walked away from collecting forever. You just never know. So give customer service, be polite, answer questions, help people along. Number two is advertising. If you don't advertise, um, your show's going to be in trouble. And I'm very grateful that Fun has a healthy advertising budget. We, we advertise in the trade publications throughout the year, probably close to about $50,000, and spend $30,000 on radio and TV advertising for the show as well. But we don't ever take for granted that, oh, everybody knows about Fun, they're going to be there. Mm, not necessarily. So put your advertising out. We have new dealers, new collectors come into every Fun show. 
um, the, and they tend to come back. So I also track how the table sales are going. We have a set budget sort of for advertising, and if something big happens and all of a sudden it, coming into the show, we start selling a lot more tables, which actually happened this year. We were stuck around 550 and all of a sudden we were at 603, boom. So what I do is I take a percentage of that extra horse money and pour it into advertising. Because now you've got more dealers coming, you better get more public in there to support those dealers. So you kind of have to hit that, again, it's a lot of balance involved. So to me, that's the, the two things to get people to the show, is customer service and advertising. So now you've got them there. How are you gonna keep them coming back? You want them to come back every year and bring a friend. To me, number one, and, and this was supported too by the survey results Gary was reading a while ago, education. Give them educational opportunities once they get here. Anybody can buy coins off the internet. Anybody can go to eBay and buy coins. What kind of education are you getting? None. Uh, also, a lot of us are 501c3 organizations. We need to pay attention to that. We need to fulfill our mission and offer those educational opportunities. If you want to convince your attendees that it's worth their efforts to come to the bigger conventions, you have to offer them something they can't get on the internet. I think educational seminars is number one. Uh, you've got to have a variety of topics and, and popular topics. Obviously, a uh, seminar on silver dollars is going to fill a lot more spaces in the room than yap stones from a small island. And don't throw stones at me if you collect yaps. It's nothing against yap stones. It's just a smaller audience. So uh, <clears throat> outside of educational seminars, you also have all your specialty club meetings. Encourage those clubs to meet. You, you can have groups come in, the Mint, the BEP, or with a spider press, even your auction catalogs from your auction company. You can get an education by reading an auction catalog. So throw out all these other educational opportunities. And the third thing is camaraderie. I think that is critical. There is no camaraderie on eBay. Um, as a convention planner, I probably pay a lot more attention to education. As a convention attendee, camaraderie is, my, is what I go for. So once you go, to, to put yourself out there, get your favorite dealers, join some clubs, attend the seminars, do whatever you need to do to establish some relationships, because you'll definitely want to keep going back. Other than that, uh, I have a little something about security, but I don't get involved in that. Just hire the best security company you can get. Uh, for me, I don't want to do business with anybody other than positive protection. Let them handle it for you and stay out of their way. That's my goal. So my sincere hope is that numismatic conventions will continue well into the future. I truly feel disappointed for collectors who don't attend them. I think they're missing the boat. They're missing to me. They're missing out on what it's all about rather than just, you know, buying coins off the internet. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, there's no question that finding venues, especially for Fun Show, Fun Show has a great venue here, obviously, and they've been here for many years. So they're kind of locked in and everybody enjoys coming down here and getting away from the cold weather. Uh, but as far as A&A &A, having shows in the summertime, it's difficult to find venues getting more and more different because of tax laws, because of union problems and things of that nature. So we really have to be uh, cognizant of that in the future. Uh, speaking of that, this Thursday we're actually having a, a gathering of show promoters, uh, a meeting of show promoters that have three day or longer shows. We've invited them to a uh, discussion on Thursday to talk about ways we can improve shows improve it for them, improve it for collectors, improve it for dealers, and so on. So we hope we will get a lot out of that. Uh, another th important thing that Cindy mentioned is clubs. I, I have a real strong feeling that, that clubs are kind of the lifeblood of the hobby. That's where collectors are developed and, and you know share that camaraderie, uh, learn about collecting, and hopefully eventually make it to some of our larger shows. Um, Another thing too on uh, conventions is the wow factor. I think you got to get the wow factor in there. When somebody comes in, if they're, especially if they're new to the hobby, you want them to really feel like they're, you know, overwhelmed by the by what they see and what they encounter when they come to a clean show. So that's a 
that's a big plus also. Um, let's see. Okay, we're good that. Our next speaker was to be John Feigenbaum, and as I mentioned to you, he is, was unable to make it out on time. Uh, his talk, though, will be in your packets at the end of the symposium, so make sure you review John's comments. I think you'll find those interesting as well about the uh, future of coin pricing and how the coin dealer newsletter and you know things like that are, are play a role in pricing. Um, so moving ahead to the di digital future, what we can uh, hope for in media and digital future, Charles Morgan will present that for us. Um, hi everybody. Um, I wrote a paper, it's in the packet, and uh, my comments are gonna be more off the cuff. They're gonna hew sort of close to what I wrote, but it's not verbatim. Um, I find that, you know, as a collector who came into the hobby in the 1980s as a child, um, Morton Stack taught me about how to collect typesets from a book my grandmother gave me. The Red Book taught me that coins from the colonial period to the present were cool. And uh, coin boards were basically the avenue in which I participated in the hobby, even though all I could do was pull coins out of change. Uh, I experienced the hobby in many forms and many phases over my life. I fell in and out of coins and uh, came back as an adult. Uh, I had a very sophisticated upbringing because I belonged to Generation X, uh, the generation that essentially built the internet. And uh, because uh, we were very sophisticated media consumers, the things that we expect, the things that we see and observe are probably more sophisticated than we're given credit for. Uh, I look at the hobby as a Generation X person. I publish a publication that's aimed towards Generation X collectors. Uh, of about the 300,000 people that come to our site each month, 80% are between the ages of 20 and 55. And uh, this is an audience that's interested in ancient coins and world coins and U.S. coins and modern coins and classic coins. Uh, every time they see a news story in the mainstream media about $300,000 and $19.82, they think they have one. But more often than not, once people stick around longer, they start to develop a sophisticated appreciation for the hobby. The future that awaits the hobby as it comes to the digital media is something that I think the elder statesmen in the hobby have to come to a day of reckoning about. The fact of the matter is I cannot look at a major auction and preview lots in that auction without immediately, without much effort and without even intending to do so, finding that many of the coins were available maybe a couple months ago in a different auction and a slightly lower graded holder. And if I can find that without looking for it, and my job is to publicize the sale, you know that sophisticated collectors already know the game. And so if you're presenting your hobby and your industry in such a way where it is shambolic, you can't expect many people to stay. Another thing that's the problem is that 30 years ago, I think this industry had one of its most major innovations and that was the advent of uh, third-party grading. I'm not necessarily against third-party grading. I think it actually added tremendous arbitrage to coins and created a, a different type of market. One of the things it did, however, is it gentrified the coin collecting hobby. Out were the typical small-time collectors who would frequent local coin shops and spend their disposable income to buy about good 1916D mercury dimes and worn out 1914 deep pennies, and in came the people who uh, dealers now had access to their investment income. The problem with that notion is coins have proven over time not to be a tremendous investment. In fact, actually, if you compare prices of coins purchased at the height of the, uh, the third-party grading boom during its introduction and adjust for inflation, the stock market pretty much beats most coins. So if the premise is that this is an investment and it's actually not a great investment, not as good as other forms of investment, then you have a long-term problem with sophisticated buyers. And when you've created a product that's out of the range of the common people, the people who basically the back of the hobby was built on, you have a very narrow market that you have to cater to. Now this narrow market can sustain the industry, but it won't sustain it for long. Because my generation, as we come into the hobby and become the main demographic, are so sophisticated and such great users of the internet 
that all of the tools, all the digital tools that have revolutionized our hobby in the last 10 or so years from heritage to robust uh, auction uh, records to Stacks Bowers auction records to even eBay records and other sites that, that, that basically scrape, scrape this information, it will tell people what is going on. Um, great inflation by itself isn't really, it's a symptom of a problem, but it's not ultimately the, the cause of the problem. The problem really is, is that the product that we create and provide, or the third party services provide, is not sophisticated enough. Uh, generally speaking, two human beings looking at a coin and sort of eyeballing the gray, based on tremendous pattern recognition skills, I'm sure, is not scientific approach. It's not the way diamonds are graded. It's not, it's not the way uh, CAD programs operate to, to put uh, complicated pieces of machinery together. It's also not the way modern mints are starting to evaluate their own product before they ship them out. I was at the World Mint Directors Conference and I saw an Austrian firm build a machine that did 2D, 3D stereoscopic imaging in real time of coins as they went through a conveyor belt. They could tell within a second whether a coin was perfect or not. So I think it's incumbent upon the industry and the institutional firms in our industry to embrace change and to create products that are more innovative. I think it would be easier for a coin dealer to sell an MS67 Morgan dollar if AI was the first grader, a human grader was the second grader, and when you looked up a certain number, you saw an in-depth like map with all the hits on the coin and computer analysis about how big the strike was, what percentage of the surface is free of marks, how much original luster is left. And all this can be done, should be done, and may raise the cost of grading, but ultimately the value of grading is being diminished to the point where you can go on eBay and see coins for sale, modern coins, mind you, but for much less than it costs to actually get them graded. And common Morgan dollars, the same way. It's not worth getting them graded. And um, silver eagles, the same way. So this is, this is one thing. Another thing that I think that we missed the boat on is that we don't present this hobby to the marketplace in a way that is very logical to me. Uh, if, uh, I, I noticed when I went to the uh, Portland A&A &A and I, I, I was thinking about buying some coins in the Stacks auction and I was looking through it and I noticed out of uh, the couple thousand coins in that, in that catalog, uh, me and my wife probably make about $200,000 a year. And uh, I could only afford probably a handful of the coins. I mean, I really could. I mean, if I came home with a $10,000 coin, I think I'd be sleeping on the couch in somebody else's house. Uh, so, so the point is, if, if that is the product that we are selling at the high end, and this I consider the high end of the market, then the venues in which we get the word out have to be more sophisticated. Uh, one of the ways I think we can do that and probably grow the A&A &A is to get the a a to either get an endowment or to invest the money to put the numismatist on newsstands. Uh, also probably to spend some money putting them in doctor's offices or lawyer's offices in major metropolitan areas. I think a three or five year program where we try to do this would not only grow the a a but it would give collectors or potential collectors a far more sophisticated look at the hobby than they're getting. And this is no slide on the other publications that are already in the market. I just think that we need more of them. Um, I'm not equipped as a one or two man band and a, with a website to make my own print publication, but the ANA already has a great one, and I think it would, it's, it's time that it competes in that marketplace. Another thing that I think we need to keep in mind is that digital technologies have developed to the point where no person or business is going to have a monopoly on them. I'm not going to be the only person that creates videos. Um, I'm not going to be the only person that has a website. Uh, I'm not going to be the only person with the talent to do what I do. Uh, the problem that exists, though, is when we make the industry too diffuse and everybody tries to do their own thing, they just create little, little places where a couple people see what they're having to say, and we don't really amplify the message. So I think it's important and probably incumbent upon us as an industry to support all of the for-profit and non-for-profit industry publications. I think we need more diverse opinions out in the wild. I think we need more sophisticated writing, more sophisticated analysis. Uh, I think we actually need real journalism, which we don't much have due to uh, some of the conflicts of interest that arise with this.
basically getting all of your revenue from a, a closed industry. But I, I think more often than not, uh, the internet and people on the internet are savvy enough to know what we're up to. I think it's time we uh, develop a media a platform that recognizes the fact that you can't get away with uh, what we used to be able to. And finally, I think the last thing I think is the most important thing is uh, how we recruit. Um, we are missing the boat, and I think that uh, the thing that we have to keep in mind is uh, it's not retirees or children that are the most important people that we need to focus on. It's really people my age and, and Rob's age, and I'm sure the age of several of the people in the audience. People under 50 are super important for this industry. We can't wait 30 years for a 14-year-old to have a career job and buy the coins that we were trying to sell today. And so I think with more sophisticated projects, more sophisticated outreach, uh, and more innovation, we can probably change the hobby. And it's going to be incumbent on probably my generation to do that because a lot of capital is getting ready to leave this industry. As dealers are getting in their upper 60s, when they decide to retire, if they don't have a transition plan where someone else is going to do that business, their, their expertise and knowledge and their money is going to be gone. So we're going to have to build an industry with, with less capital than we have today. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, yeah, I think uh, one of the things that Charles was saying, obviously, is the Gen Xers. Uh, that's the demographic that we really need to focus on at the moment because those are the people that have, you know, they've raised a family, they've gone through school, uh, they've got some disposable income now and they want to start a hobby or whatever. Those are the ones we really got to go after to capture. And that's not to say we ignore our current collectors or young people. We definitely have to go after that demographic as well. So, um, but it's interesting to me the the digitization that, that, that Charles mentioned of the numismatic hobby is entering its fourth decade. So it's been around for a long time, but just in the past 10 years, I would say that's accelerated dramatically. So technology is certainly making a huge impact um, you know, on the industry itself. Um, and, and another important thing that he mentioned was operating in an industry that so easily and so often undermines its own credibility. Think about that, the short-term gains uh, is illustrated of our lack of appreciation of just how encyclopedic the amount of information having to do with coins and coin transactions is online. So a sophisticated person thinking about getting into coin collecting or investing in coins even, uh, they've got all that information out there. They can go search it out. So, you know, trying to undermine that is a, is a negative to, to our hobby for sure. Anyway, thank you, Charles. And uh, last but not least, a guy that I think probably has done more to promote numismatics, coin collecting, the coin hobby than anybody else around. The number of uh, books and uh, auction catalogs and great auctions and things that he's been involved in uh, is phenomenal. I don't think anybody holds a candle to that. So I want to welcome Dave Bowers. Thank you very much for inviting me. I've never uh, written a speech before in my life. I've probably given 500 speeches. I'm not going to read what I wrote, uh, but you can read it. Um, but uh, I'm wrapping things up. A few comments. Uh, Cindy Whitker here uh, started collecting because her then husband collected, and in the 1990s would write me letters and sign them tokenly yours. She discovered new varieties of Civil War tokens, was a foundation and is a good example of a woman who not only is a numismatist and a leader now, but also did research, writing, and so forth. And Cindy, if you run for president, I'll, I'll vote for you in 2000. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm an idealist, as some of you know, having been in this since 1952. And, probably the only person in this uh, room who interviewed B. Max Mel, for example. Uh, and uh, right now, we're, we are a slave to grades. Uh, back in 1950s, 1960s, as, as the first speaker said, the coin was uncirculated, it was proof. Now we have uh, MS-62+, plus, MS-63, MS-63 with a shield, MS-64 with a star. Nobody has any idea what these mean. We also have, uh, we also have uh, uh, very 
sophisticated counterfeits. Beth Dysher's in the back row there is a, a poster example of a lady, a, a, lady, a Renaissance lady, who uh, who handled uh, uh, who handled uh, edited Coin World for a long time, and now is doing it. To, I have to tell you, Beth Dysher's story. I've written for Coin World ever since 1961. There's never been any columnist like this. And the only thing Beth ever rejected, and she probably remembered this, I once said I was going to a fun show, and as I entered the bourse, I was confronted by predators. And then, then I talked about my story, and then later I said, that's because the Florida Wildlife Association had some lynxes and rattlesnakes. <laughs> and and Beth, Beth said, well, it might be right, but it throws people off. So that was the only correction that I've ever had, but I loved Beth dearly. And uh, so I have to say that. But we're a slave to grace. Uh, like art right now is a, a, a hitting new highs with $100 million paintings, uh, antiques, postcards, antique automobiles, books, uh, everything else are not slaves to grading. Nobody knows if you buy a Kerr and I print and I collect them, uh, you want to know it's a nice print, just like a coin collector would like to know it was a nice coin uh, 40 years ago. So we're boxed ourselves into a corner with uh, uh, all this nonsense about grading, and anybody coming would be frightened. Also, counterfeiting is very dangerous. It's not new. It used to be we have had altered dates and things. But uh, I'm uh, the editor, along with uh, Jeff Garrett of uh, uh, Mega Red Number no. Five. That's that six-pound book uh, of 1,500 pages, which, believe it or not, has sold uh, 12,500 copies at $49 each. And at the last ANA convention, a mother came up with their two little kids and bought one for each. But uh, it has a lot of information in it. But I did a chat. Je Jeff has done a chapter on the, the current market, so you can read about the market if you buy the next edition. And I did two long chapters on counterfeiting and on grading. But then I just sent a note to Jeff the other, yesterday or the day before. I think we need to really minimize these, because if you accentuate the negative, uh, you know, it's just going to throw people off. So my thing is that, that I'll mention that counterfeiting is very dangerous, and so is and grading is confusing. But the purpose of uh, Mega Red is to tell you how interesting coins are. Uh, the main thing, uh, also, there are no standard ethical standards at all in coin business. The uh, PNG has felons on board. The ANA has many. I write write to the ANA uh, regularly and say, why don't you et, et, why don't you set up ethics? The answer is we act on we act on individual complaints. They have no. And I said, why don't you do ethics? We're afraid of lawsuits. Okay. Well, I was with the ANA and the Federal Trade Commission a number of years ago. We went after dealers. We put some of them in jail. No, no uh, criminal dealer ever sued the ANA. And uh, so, but anyway, the ANA doesn't want to act, and that's okay. I think it's very harmful to the business. We do have uh, uh, medical doctors have. Uh, uh, have to have some some standards. Uh, we have certified financial planners, which are a little plus and minuses, but uh, at least it's something. We have, really have nothing in the way of any ethical uh, standards that have to be met to either join the ANA or the PNG, if you look at a close. Uh, but I love the ANA, and I, uh, probably the oldest member of the PNG, and I like that too. The, uh, the clubs, the popular clubs where you go and go and uh, the YMCA and have, uh, I, I don't think we're going to have, a, are we going to have a time situation here? No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I mean, I can stop, I can even start my thing. I'm just recapping some ideas based on the things I've heard. It's just sort of like no one goes bowling anymore. I don't think people are take out, go uh, Thursday night once a month to the YMCA or the Holiday Inn and go to coin shows. But the specialized societies, the Civil War Token Society, of which Cindy was a foundation stone, uh, the uh, early American coppers, uh, the colonial collectors, the Liberty City Coin Club, Barber Coin Club, all those are doing extremely well, uh, the, uh, very well. But these are, uh, these are composed of collectors. Uh, uh, investment is good. And uh, my little paper here, if you, if I had in 1959, I bought a lot of Civil War tokens from George Fold, and I offered I offered them where you could buy like a hundred different for ninety dollars. If you had spent ten thousand dollars in 1959 on Civil War tokens, you'd have a million dollars today. If you spent uh, ten thousand dollars on obsolete paper money, 
uh, like uh, notes of New Jersey and so forth, your money would have multiplied like 100 times. But these are ignored. People say, well, I'm looking at gold and silver. Somebody comes in for gold and silver. I was at a A&A show a little while ago or some show, and some people remember this. We were in a row, and they said, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, I, was, I don't know, forgot whether David Hall or somebody was running it. How many people here think gold would be $5,000 in two years? Everybody raised their hands. I said, I did, why didn't you raise your hand? Well, I don't think it will be. But people come in and they get false expectations. And, and go, I love gold. Right now we have a real weird situation in gold where dealers are paying less than face value for double eagles. Never heard of such a thing. But uh, that's the way it is. But uh, collectors are here. That, uh, Eric Newman was a friend of mine from the 1950s until he passed away. Ken Brissett, uh, I first met in like 1953. He's still a good friend. Wrote to me yesterday. Harry Salyers is a good friend. Uh, Leonard Augsburger, Joel Oros, uh, anyone who's interested in collecting tends to stay. Anyone comes in and, want, and, and is only interested in investment doesn't tend to stay. By the way, I see Julian Liebman in the back there. He's a poster example of what a dealer should be like. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, back, back to my what the future can learn from the past. I, uh, at Penn State, I studied statistics and also read the the popular delusion and the madness of crowds, if any of you read that about the tulip mania. And I was the first person to study cycles in the coin market and published it in 1962 or three. And since then, I've kept up on it. I predicted every cycle that has existed in the coin market. I've never lost a single dollar in my company by, by failing, uh, because just by looking, and I did, pre did call and publicize the last coin market high for general coins was August 19, uh, 2013. And a certain collector in Texas said, if I sell my collection now, am I, am I losing? Am I going to regret not holding them? And I told him, I said, I guarantee that the market is going to be peaking soon, and you won't lose. And that, and that, that collection has been sold, and uh, uh, some of these records would not be equal. Again, we sold David Sunman's collection of colonial uh, colonial uh, pine tree shillings and things a few years ago at the height of the market. Uh, markets go up and down, including good things and bad things. The thing to do is avoid fads. Uh, I gave a lecture at Harvard for 18 years on collectibles. I was the uh, point person on uh, for Harvard, and they had a class on museology for would-be museum curators who came. And it was my. He said, "They said now we're going to introduce Dave Bowers." who's a real life person. He's actually bought curry knives, prints, and bought antique cars and coins in the real market. Tell him about the real market. So I did that, and, uh, I, and one of my things was talking about fads, and we had like Beanie Babies, Tickle Me Elmo, uh, Cabbage Patch Dolls, and one of my, one of my uh, classes, the Duchess of Windsor, you might remember her, uh, she died, and her, uh, I think it was Christie sold her, sold her jewels of her say millions of dollars, and then uh, he said I can have extra time. What? <laughs> what? Five minutes. Five minutes. Uh, OK, uh, five minutes. OK. Anyway, avoid fads, because they do change. I did, uh, right now, people buy muscle cars. Uh, they used to buy Duesenbergs and, and, and Thomas Flyers. Avoid fads. In Newman's Max, there have been many, many fads. The hot ticket of the, of the, of the investment market in the 1950s it was the 1950 D nickel, which seemed to go up in price about every month, peaked out at $1,400 in early 1965. And today, you can buy it for, buy it for one third of the price. You can buy commemorative coins, gem uncirculated, uh, for about one fifth the price they were in uh, in 1989. And that's a generation ago. Uh, I love I love commemoratives. Uh, so. Uh, Anyway, I try to avoid cycles. A good way to do that is to uh, pick a specialty or even a, something like a typeset. Collect carefully. Don't be a slave to grades. There's some, something nice someone mentioned it, about good 1916 D dime. When I started, people brought up their, their collection of walking liberty halves and said, here's my collection of uh, the 1916 DNS or BF and so forth. The ones since 1938 are all in circulating, and we liked it. Today, if you said, uh, I have a uh, I have a 1921s half dollar in 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 uh, BF because I can afford it. Oh, 
well, that's junk. You know, so we, we, we have actually trashed a lot of traditional numismatic things, except in copper, you can have a nice uh, Warren Colonial Connecticut copper or 1794 large set in VG, and it'll be admired, but try, you can't try it with a Morgan dollar. Uh, so uh, anyway, the, the greatest investment profits have been made by knowledgeable collectors, uh, and I say collectors, and also being a traditionalist, I think we're, I don't, I never like the term industry, I think we're arts. You have medical arts if you're a doctor. My daughter-in-law is a surgeon, uh, the uh, uh, mother that my two kids over there, she runs the UMass Medical OBGYN thing, and she's engaged in medical arts. She's not in engaged in the surgery industry, in my opinion. And uh, I think if we look at the art, science, and history of coins, and uh, not and not look at it as an industry. Of course, if you're a counterfeiter, that's an industry. Uh, you know, you're making your own coins. Uh, anyway, I feel the market is very strong at present levels. It's a little lower than before, but the auctions we've had have been very dynamic. I expect the auction held by another firm here will probably be very good in uh, Florida. And I think the whole uh, uh, hobby dash industry is very strong, but it has been has been very nicely demonstrated tonight. It's very diverse. It's very changed. Uh, the main, the main success in, in uh, collecting, in my opinion, and this is advice is to collectors, and not dealers, is to specialize, go slowly, don't be great conscious, and uh, build a very nice library of interesting books and.